Matthew chapter 5. We are coming to the last section of this chapter, namely verse 43 to 48. Uh, I will take to Lord's Day, today, this today and next Lord's Day, to preach from this text. Today the title of our devotion is Love Your Enemies. Love Your Enemies. Shall we read this passage? Join me. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemies. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have we? Do not even the publicans the same. If ye salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Jesus has been confronting various erroneous ideas that existed in the time of his life on earth, especially among the Jews. They have often misquoted, misinterpreted, and misapplied the words of God in the Old Testament. Last Lord's Day, we considered a particular law of God in the Old Testament, which has been uh, propagated as a law of retaliation, <coughs> lex talionis. That is to say, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Let's revenge, but we have learned it was not for the purpose of revenge God gave that command. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. As some theologians would like to refer to it, it is a law of compensation. It's a just recompense. It's not retaliation out of anger. Now, immediately after that correction of the misconception of the people, Jesus emphasized that what matters the most in our relationship with people is not that we feel that we have been served well or we have been honored, but that we have honored others in love. In every human relationship, God expects his people to consider their own feelings the last. But the feeling of those around them. When I said feeling, not evil feelings, but good feelings. And meaning to say feelings that are honorable and, and acceptable before God. I can suffer anything, but my brother must be served. I can suffer any loss, but those around me must do well. This is the total sum of Christ. Isn't it? He gave himself that we may be saved. He gave himself on the cross and died that we may have eternal life. He was always giving. He came not to be ministered but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for others. And it was Jesus' greatest concern 
that all those who say that they belong to God will be like him. That's why, you know, this passage ended up with this great statement. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's the challenge. Uh, you know, a lot of thoughts rushes into my mind. I, because I've already thought about what I'm preaching next week, that also comes to my mind. I'm forced to say things which I thought I would only say next week. But maybe you can have a little bit about next week as well. Now, I'm going to emphasize mainly on that last verse, be perfect even as your father is perfect. The reason is, Jesus repeatedly says in this passage that our concerns about ourselves must go far beyond people around us. Take a look at this. It's really uh, challenging to us how Jesus put this across. Verse 46 at the end. After saying, if you love them which love you, what reward have you? He says, do not even the publicans do the same? I mean, if you do only what people do, what's the difference? Your life must be better than the publicans, but you just behave like everybody else. And then he goes on, verse 47, and he says, if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? You as a Christian, your standards are not to be plucked to the, uh, the behavior of others. You have to have something more than what you see among human race. And then Jesus says, be perfect as I am perfect. Or be perfect as your father is perfect. Do you understand? We have a high calling. A very high calling. Because we are God's children. Our feelings had to be controlled for a nobler purpose. Not to be just like others, but much more than others. Not to show off, because there's nothing to show off, because our standard is the perfect holiness of God. So even though, let's say, I refuse to tell lies when everybody else told lies, I shouldn't be feeling, oh, I'm great, because the standard is who? God. My life is not over it. I may lie next moment for some other reason. And that should make me very, very humble and, and uh, desperate in trusting God. Lord, help me. Yes, one step higher, but how many more steps to go? <coughs> Our eyes have to be lifted from the surroundings up to the person and nature of our God. Our affections have to be set upon things above, not things on this earth. We are called out of this world. We are made heaven's citizens. Our conversation is in heaven while we are living on this earth. You see, my dear brothers and sisters, if we are going to be thinking day and night about the way people behave and how, what kind of system of justice exists in this world, and that's all we have to live up to, then we are nothing but just pure earthlings. Our hearts and minds must escape all this. Jesus didn't go to the court, neither appear before the pilot or anyone to talk about his rights. He let them do what they do because he knew nothing in this world can ever per serve perfect justice. If they would do harm to me, I would take it. I just want to be sure it is my father's will. So in prayer, he prepared himself and went through the trials. He suffered all and he loved his enemies and prayed for them while he was hanging on the cross. Now this is what the total sum of this teaching we have right in this passage and in the rest of the Sermon on Mount. 
Whenever God, the Lord Jesus talks to us about our relationship with fellow people, fellow Christians, fellow men in the society, he wants us to consider these things not according to our feelings, but according to our God's righteousness. Standard is very high, my brothers. Very high indeed. And so Jesus says, now let me help you. Listen, this is what people normally say. You Jews, as religious fellows, you also say the same. And Jesus is going to say, your religious sayings is nothing better than the worldly people. It's the same. That's his point. Unless you put your mind on my standard and see what I'm saying, you will never get it. And let's see. Please look at verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as and hate thine enemy. <laughs> By the way, this is not what the Bible teaches. Some people wrongly say this is what Old Testament teach. No, Old Testament does not teach us to hate our enemies. In fact, it teaches us to love enemies. You remember a while ago we read from the book of Proverbs, chapter 25. Do you remember? Let's go there, please. Proverbs 25. Just want to clarify this. Loving the enemy is nothing new that Jesus said. It has already been said in the Old Testament. People who do not understand the scripture often uh, teach wrong things. So let's turn to Proverbs 25. And here, in verse 21, you read, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. Does it tell you to hate your enemy? No. <laughs> if your bread is little, still you've got to give, you know, because God already said, if your enemy is hungry, you feed him. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. Go and draw from the well, pour it into a, a jar, bringing a cross, and pour it into a cup and give your enemy who is thirsty and dying. Don't stand there and clap. Good, you, you deserve it. <laughs> Last time when you said all the bad things, you should have remembered, okay? Now I will watch you dying. No, that's totally ungodly. No part of the scripture ever teaches us that. Verse 22. If thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. You know, if he is a really bad fellow, don't worry, vengeance belongs to the Lord. You do your part, prove your innocence more and more. If, if your innocence is proved more and more, when you become more and more gracious, more and more loving, compassionate, and thus your innocence is proven. And your enemy's guilt affirmed. We should never retaliate. We should never revenge. And that does not belong to us. Vengeance belongs to God. At all times we must be prepared to forgive. Now, of course, I understand. There are those who do not want forgiveness. Even if you say sorry to a person, they may not accept it. Then that's not your fault. But even if that person doesn't accept your sorry, you just calmly wait for the day the person will change. And when the person is ready, you'll be ready. Don't say, huh, I told you sorry two times, you didn't want. Now you come. Sorry, no more. Time is over. There's a time for everything. No, time shall not end until you die. <laughs> until you die, you have, moment, you have all the opportunities which God gave to reconcile. And we must ever ready to reconcile. Now, even if our enemy, the one who offended us, do not want to, uh, do not want to uh, make it right with us or want to be reconciled, then look, if the person is in trouble, go ahead and help the person. Nowhere here, Bible says, oh, if your enemy is hungry and if he come and beg you for food, then you give. No. If you know that your enemy is hungry, go and feed him. 
That's what it says. But I must put a word here. Make sure your enemy is not pretending to be hungry. Okay? That may be a trap. So be wise, okay? We must be wise as serpent and gentle as dove. There are some who pretend, you know, to get you there and then whack you. <laughs> so we've got to be careful of those people. However, our heart must be genuinely sympathetic. Genuinely sympathetic. So if thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. <laughs> How wonderful are these words of our Lord. And also the scripture clearly tells us. You know, would you please go to a few more verses in the book of Proverbs. Let's go to chapter 24 verse 17. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 5. Oh, sorry, did I say 24 to you? I'm sorry. Proverbs 24, verse 17 first. I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay, reading together. Rejoice not when thine enemy falleth, and let not thine heart be glad when he stumbleth. Read verse 18 as well. Lest the Lord see it as it ple displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Okay, so if you decide to revenge a person, God will not revenge. You understand? Because you unjustly carried out your anger. God will never be unjust. Sometimes our, our feelings can be out of misunderstanding. We often misunderstand people. We misjudge circumstances. We misread things. And then we conclude we are right. But God never does that, you see. So we don't want to be unjust in our revenge. I mean, if any, any vengeance at all, leave it to God. God will know how to measure the right amount in the right way to those people. We leave it to God. That's God's business. And he does it well. For us, because we have all, uh, all tendencies and potential to be wrong in carrying out justice, we leave it to God and then say, Lord, make me a purer person. Make me kinder. Make me gracious. Teach me. And we surrender to God. And doing so, we avoid any uh, real potential within us to become worse. You see, when people offend us, all sorts of evil emotions come up in our hearts. And we can plan and scheme things that are much worse than, that, than the other has done to us. You understand what I mean? That's what provocation does. Provocations actually make us even worse than our enemies. Our feelings can be so strong that we may murder people. The person may only, only have you know, caused a wound to us, but we may in return take the person's life. That's how hard we can be. The person might have said just one vulgar word. You may retaliate with 20 vulgar words. That's how we are vulnerable to our sinful nature. And so the Bible tells us, do not do that. Leave the matter of justice to God and in this reaction to others who hurt you, try and show love. Love your enemies. Not just love your neighbor. Yes, you have to love your neighbor. See, Jesus contradicted this notion that existed among the people. We have the right to retaliate. We have the right to revenge our enemies. And so Jesus said in verse 44, let's go back to Matthew um, chapter 5. And verse 44, Jesus says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Wow. Christ comes across with such clarity in his statements. 
He leaves nothing for us to guess. Oh, how a blessed Savior. It comes out of his heart. He is what he says. And what he says is what he is. You want to know where to find a real good example of this? Look to the one who spoke this. Christ. Jesus. And you want to know who received these blessings? Look at yourself. You are the one. <laughs> you are his enemy. For whom he came. Now let's see what Jesus said. In loving our enemies. What should we do? Love your enemies. Wow. That's the first one. Love your enemies. When you are. Addressed. With hatred. You return. You respond to it. With love. When people come. Dashing at you. Want to squeeze you up. You quietly. Calmly stand there. Yes brother. What can I do for you? Ah, don't pretend to me. In front of me. You are a terrible fellow. I know you. You just quietly stand there. Lord teach me to love. This is getting tough. You know I know. That. As people often say, it's easy to say, hard to practice, you know. Pastor, you can preach for one hour on love your enemies. But let's try. I agree with you, my brothers and sisters. It is the hardest thing because it is not natural to us to love our enemies. And so the Lord commands us. Now, when the Lord, who has absolute authority of our mind, our soul, and our body... Tells us, love that man whom I just permitted to come to you with hatred. You know, if God didn't want an enemy to come near you, he will not come anywhere near your neighborhood, let me tell you. He won't even appear in your town. But if God comes, God allows a man to come to your presence, to your place of work, to your place of living. Or in the church. That's because God allowed it. So you will obey your God. You understand? And what is the thing you obey? Love the one who now comes to hate me. When Judas came to Christ to betray him. And kissed him. With the token of love. What a counterfeit love. Jesus said, my friend. Why did you come? That's Jesus' words. My friend. <laughs> friend. He loved him. He loved Judas to the last minute. He did no harm to Judas. He said nothing evil. He didn't say you betrayer. You think I don't know why you came and kissed me? You, you. No, no, no drama there. <laughs> it was such serenity, such calmness. Jesus accepted his kiss. You know, the Lord knows everything. When, the, when Judas came with that betrayal, and he came, mm, Jesus and came to kiss, he could have slapped his face and pushed him down. <laughs> you? No, the Lord did nothing of that sort. He knew exact intensity of this wickedness that Judas came to fulfill. He knew it. He came to breathe death. He gave him the kiss of death. And that Jesus affirmed this love. I love my Lord Jesus and how I wish I would be like him. Don't you? Do you adore your Savior? Do you? How can you not? Because you don't see anything like this in this world unless you look to Christ 
who lived on this earth. He says to us, love your enemies as I have loved you. Don't go looking anywhere else. Don't give excuses. He entertained no excuse from us. No, don't you dare to say, you can say by hard to do. That's why he tells you again, you won't change his word. He will repeat, love your enemy. By hard to do, love your enemy. So what do you do? You fall on your knees and pray or humble your heart and say, Lord, how wicked I am. I'm still not willing to obey you. My heart is so hardened. You see, this enemy actually teaches me how wicked I am. <laughs> still not ready to obey my God. And you pray with repentance. In fact, many a time, people's hatred toward us exposes our own sinfulness. People's wickedness toward us often shows us how impatient, how unforgiving, how unkind, how different we are from our Savior whom we worship. So, my dear brothers, loving your enemies is a matter of worship of your Savior. It's a matter of obedience of your Savior. Don't you ever think you can worship if you don't love your enemies. Because if you don't love your enemies, you are standing in utter rebellion against Christ who said these things. It's tough. But our Savior will help us. It doesn't matter what people do to us. God knows. Look at the next statement he said in verse 44. Do good to them that hate you. <laughs> Love and hatred is a disposition of your heart. The next step, that heart that is full of love now must express itself. Love is not just a feeling, but a feeling expressed. Now, a lot of people today think love is a flying kiss. I love you all. Next Lord's Day I see you. Take care. That's how mega church pastors would do. I love you. They learn from Michael Jackson. Love you. Go for the concerts. <coughs> no. You love, then do good. Do good to who? <laughs> to your enemies. Those who hurt you. Those who hated you. Those who make sure you know that person hates you. They will come to your face and say, I hate you. And you say, brother, let me show you the way out. <laughs> let me walk with you. Let's have a cup of drink. Cool down. But don't say cool down. Okay, because if you say cool down, they'll provoke him. You say, come, uh, let's go outside. Let's get a cup of water. We talk outside, come. And serve him with a cup of water. And then you will say, <laughs> you think what? Well, the cup of water you can buy my patience? No. Then you say, right, now tell me, how did I offend you? But it doesn't mean he is going to agree with you, Okay. He may continue to hate you, but keep loving. You can tell him, okay, brother, enough is enough. I think you have spoken enough. I'm not going to accept this. And I'm leaving. And you leave the place. Because you don't want to <coughs> create a scenario that cannot be controlled. So you can firmly say it. You can probably at some point of time even uh, raise your voice a little bit to get across and say, look, brother, it's enough. I'm not going to listen to all these nonsense, which is not true. You go and think what I said, okay? We will talk again. Please take your time. It is tough. You may ask me, Pastor Goshi, have you mastered this? Not yet. 
<laughs> it is with great fear I'm, pre I'm preaching this. Because after this statement, the Lord says, be perfect as your father is perfect. This is being like God. But this is what we have. We, have, we are called to. It's a great and noble calling. And the Lord also said, pray for them which despitefully use you. <laughs> what a statement. Pray for them who abuse you. When they speak evil about you, pray for them. I want to ask you, have you noticed that Jesus often went away from the crowd to pray, sometimes through the night, sometimes for days? He goes away into wilderness, up the mountains, sometimes into the desert. What was he praying? Father, give me food. Father, give me a Nike shoe. Father, give me the best car. Was he praying all this? He was praying for you and me, wicked ones, whom he came to love. I want to say something to all my fellow preachers and elders of this church, and of course deacons as well. We cannot do God's work if we don't learn to pray for those who hate us. Sometimes their hatred is out of misunderstanding. Sometimes really out of wicked heart. A lot of patience is needed to go through this. I've never understood it in such great depth until recent years. And as a young man, as a pastor, you all know I started to preach in Gethsemane at the age of 25. And I've been preaching since then. This year I'm going to be 50. So almost 25 years of preaching in this church. It's not easy to stay in the same church for 25 years, let me tell you. Of course, uh, I cannot say this if Reverend Timothy Toe was here. Because he served 50 years. So I don't know whether I will live that long. But even 25 is, is really tough. You will experience all kinds of things. I thank God that Elder Ma and I have been serving 25 years together. And that's a great blessing. I think we love one another more than ever before. <laughs> Elder Ma is not looking at me, so I can't love him. <laughs> he, he is now. <laughs> well, I'm very grateful for that relationship. It was a commitment to God and to one another. Not that we didn't have any offense against one another. I'm sure we had plenty. But we always made sure we do not hurt one another unnecessarily. We may disagree on points uh, which we feel differently. We talk about it. We pray about it. We come back. Now, this is not about friends. We are talking about enemies. And we together have faced all sorts of enemies and enmity within this church. It was difficult, and it shall always be difficult. And I thank God, it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion, it's not a proposal. It's a commandment to us. And I pray this will ring in my heart every day, lest I may fail as a pastor, or I fail as a Christian. This has to be a command, because I know it's not normal, it's not natural, for any of us, including me, to do this. In the face of hatred and hurt, natural reaction is retaliation. But the Lord says, love him, do good unto him. Again, the Lord said, pray for them. Pray for them. 
We have to pinpoint these individuals and pray for them until they change. They may persecute you, as Jesus said in verse 44, but you pray. They persecute you, you pray for them. They persecute you more, and you pray more for them. So the fellow say, yeah, if you're going to pray more, I will persecute you even more. Because more persecution means more prayer, right? So come, let me beat you up. Or I make your life miserable. But don't worry. You won't persecute too long. This is the way you overcome them. <coughs> you know, a lot of people are very scared to be gracious. A lot of people are very, very, very scared to be compassionate and patient. Most people would say when they retaliate or take some very rude and tough measures to stop people, look, enough is enough. I think this guy must be taught a lesson. Here we go. You know, my dear friends, when somebody is wrong, it's our duty to tell the person he's wrong, right? There's nothing wrong, but do it in a loving way. Say it. Stand by it. Face him and say you're wrong. But don't do anything to hurt that person directly. If the person doesn't obey God's word, if he is in the church, I have to tell him, if you don't obey and if you continue to rebel and live in open sin, then there will be church disciplinary action. Now, that's not retaliation. That's to teach him there are consequences. And we do it according to God's standard. When you do it according to God's standard, it cannot be wrong. It can only be God himself acting. Now why? Look at the next verse. Jesus says it. When you patiently, lovingly, according to God's will, do all things, what happens? That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. When you follow the biblical procedures, instead of retaliation, God will prove that you are his children. He will take care of you. Even in your suffering, you will have some honor about the fact that you suffered. And it will be known that you suffered because you are a child of God and he persecuted you because he is not. And it will be known. And moreover, because you are his child and you will have a time and purpose to serve on this earth and God will keep you as his child on this earth. See, we don't want to live on earth as just mere people, as just a human being. We want to live here on earth for Christ. For to me to live is Christ, as Paul said, Philippians 1.21. To me to live is Christ. I want to live for Christ. If I can't live for Christ, if I cannot fulfill as a, as Christ's will as a Christian, then I better don't live, I better die and go to be with him. So in all of the struggles we face, we take it. By the way, I am not saying that if somebody persecutes you, you still stay there, keep on saying, beat me, beat me, beat me, do whatever you want. No, don't do it. You have to be wise. You've got to get away from there. Otherwise, you may be foolishly provoking yourself to sudden wrath. So we must pull away. We must protect ourselves. Self-defense is all right. Self-defense doesn't mean you carry a knife all the time. No, that's not what I meant. You leave the place. Be wise. Quickly run away. Of course, the other ha aspect of self-defense by violence is a matter I will talk later. But the best thing we are told is never ever let our heart be filled with wrath and revenge and burst out in anger. We, we must be careful. Now this, may, by the way, can happen in any situation. It doesn't have to be in a in a situation of great competition and arguments and uh, quarrel. It can be in your house between husband and wife. It can happen between the parents and children. I've seen young children 
you know, full of rage, throwing things at parents. Take the chair and throw at the father. Take the chair and throw at mothers. It's horrible. One of the members of this church took me to a relative's, one of his relatives' house to talk to the parents and the children because he said that to the, one of the children that this relative has is a very violent person. So I went there. I just couldn't believe my eyes. I have never seen any child like this. A primary four ch child. So rude, so rude. And when the father said, sit, I'm going to jump down. You see, and he opens the door, uh, the window, and he wants to jump down. I can't remember what level they were living, quite high up, maybe 8th or 10th floor. I'm going to jump down. Father says, sit there. I will jump, huh? And he's trying to climb the window ledge. And the father keeps quiet. Then he comes down. And then he comes and takes a, a small stool, throw at the father. You know why? He wants the father's iPad. And the father says, you don't be funny. And a string of bad words. And I said, oh, this is terrible. He is showing rage because he didn't get iPad to play a game. Now, you young people and children watch. You become so self-occupied, you don't know what you are saying to your father and mother and doing to them. It can be your parents whom you hate instead of being good and doing good to your parents, you may hurt them. It can be between husband and wife, as I said. It can be within the church. It can be pastor hurting the people and people hurting the pastor. We should never be the case. We should never be the case. God forbid. We don't want to turn our homes and our church into a place of retaliation. May God deliver us from that evil. It's horrible. And so may the words of our Lord come to our hearts. By the way, if anybody think I purposely chose this passage because I know that you are in trouble, you are wrong, okay? A lot of time people think, oh, this is so applicable. Pastor purposely preach against me. I am nothing, it has nothing to do with your presence here. This has everything to do with God's word, which I've been preaching consistently week after week. It just happened that you are here today, and I'm preaching on this text. And this is therefore God's word to you. Okay? I'm not against you. Just get your life proper and get it done. And it can be a good comfort to you as well. Maybe you have been badly attacked by people who are not righteous in their thinking. They may be Christians, but got it wrong. They can be unbelievers. They got it wrong. But let's remember, in all such persecutions, verbal assault, physical assault, we remain prayerful. Leave God to work things out. We don't take things in our hand and retaliate. I remember talking to a minister of the gospel who was in big, big tussle with somebody in the church. And he told me, I have gone to teach him a lesson. I re report him to police. I said, brother, you're a pastor. Is it so serious that you have to report to the police? Did you do all the things that God's word said you should do first? He said, well, I think it's a good advice you just said. Okay, I will go in and uh, tell the police. I withdraw my report. I said, good, go and do it. I hope he did it. I think he did it. On another occasion, a minister 
send a letter threatening the other person. I will sue you in court because you said this and this about me. You cannot do this kind of thing. If like that, how many times Jesus should have sued the Pharisees and the scribes? Huh? You tell me. How many times he should have sued us personally? No end to all this. If you cannot suffer for righteousness sake, I tell you, you will fail to live for God's glory. And the, the way we overcome all this is by prayer. Praying constantly. Praying for our enemies and praying for ourselves. That we may carry out the Lord's love. His mercy in our lives. Again, I want to conclude today's message with these words of verse 45. By doing so, you may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. The Lord is good to all. You know, when the sun comes up, he doesn't say, I will only shine on Gethsemane BP Church members today. All the rest in Singapore will be living in darkness. Does he do that? No. When the rain comes, it not only falls in the farm of a Christian, it also falls in the farm of a non-Christian. God is gracious to the believer and the unbeliever. It is his common grace, we say. His compassion is known to all. But the wicked will reject him. And yet God sends the son next day. And he will deny God and mock those who believe him. The Lord still sends his reign to the unjust. So at the end, when this unbelieving, mocker, persecutor, atheist stand before God, he will be so filled with the memory of the relentless goodness of God that blessed him. And in the light of his goodness, he sees the wickedness of his heart. And he will fall silenced by his own wickedness in the great measure of God's goodness. No word will proceed from his mouth in self-defense. In silence, when the Lord says, Depart, ye workers of iniquity, they will go. They cannot linger any further. And so, my dear brothers and sisters, we are not here to establish any self-righteousness. Even hostilities and problems we face is often an unveiling of our own weaknesses. God uses the wickedness of others to show us sometimes how impatient we are, how prone we are to get things wrong, how unforgiving we are, how impatient we are. So the Lord says, love your enemies. Not only your brothers and sisters, not only your friends, but love your enemies as well. Isn't it a higher calling? Now how many of you can genu genuinely say now, after hearing these words of Christ, Lord, all these days of my life, I've been so accustomed to love people who love me, who people who cook food for me, people who uh, visit me, people who take me for holiday or buy things when they come back from holiday. I used to love all these people. Yes, I want to continue to love them, but I want to go a higher level. There are people who never bothered to greet me. I want to love them. There are people who sp spoke bad about me. I want to love them. There are people who hurt me. I want to love them. If I see them again next time, Lord, help me to be genuinely loving. 
If I smile at them and they show a frown, frowning face, Lord, help me to accept it and smile. Can you? If you cannot pray that, who are you but the children of this world? Let's arise to sing our final hymn.